Good morning and welcome as we worship together. I'd just like to start off by remembering a couple of people in prayer. Uh, Greg Parker, who's come through surgery and knee surgery, we want to remember him, and Peter Hall as they continue to look for answers in his uh, health situation. Um, also, uh, Dora Tweedle uh, is moving and Gordon and Wanda Harvey are moving. Uh, we're sure going to miss these folks. Uh, they've been part of our family in the church, and uh, uh, we're just going to miss you guys. We wish you God's blessing, but uh, you're going to leave a hole in our congregation, that's for sure. So anyway, we want to remember uh, them as we pray this morning. And also next week is communion. It's If you can believe it, we're into October, so uh, please remember that. Okay, let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning for your goodness to us and uh, just pray for these folks uh, that we've mentioned, plus my, my little grandson, Luke. He continues to uh, do better and is home now, and we're thankful for that. So we pray for little Luke, and we just lift him up. And I pray for Greg and Pete, Lord, that you just uh, meet them in, in their situations, uh, continue to have your hand upon them and heal them. And uh, I pray for Greg, you just strengthen that knee for Pete, that they would get the answers they need to really help him. And uh, Father, for Gordon Wanda and uh, for Dora as they move, uh, Father, we uh, are going to really miss them. And I just pray that you'd be with them in a special way and bless them in this move. Watch over them and encourage them in the new places that they will live and just be with them in a special way. So, Father, as we look into your word this morning, I just pray you would encourage hearts, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you? that I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. John 14, 1 to 3. This morning we want to wrap up the rapture <laughs> to bring out our little series to a close. I hope this has been both encouraging and enlightening for you. It is our blessed hope. Allison has a device in her car. I don't know what you call it, but it lights up when uh, you go to get out to remind you that someone is in the back seat. I thought that was kind of neat, but we won't need any device when it comes to the rapture. The Lord doesn't need a reminder. It is his will that... And if I go and prepare a place for you, for you and I, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. He is coming to take us to a place he has prepared for us, and it will be wonderful. And so the premise of this is do not let do not let your hearts be troubled, my friends, this morning. The language in our passage this morning is in the context of a groom coming for his bride to take his bride to a place he has labored in love to prepare for her, an extension usually of his father's home, at least at first. A celebration, a marriage feast would take place that would last several days, depending on the economic setting of the groom. And it was a joyful, let me emphasize that, a joyful celebration. We will talk about uh, more about this in a minute in how it parallels the marriage supper of the Lamb we read about in Revelation 19 and 21. It's uh, one of the two events that will take place in heaven for us, the church, during the tribulation period. So, without further ado, let's get going. Let's start. 
Again, we have our picture here uh, from last week that Allison's put up for us, an overview of the end times. And we see the tribulation period there, a seven-year period. Um, and it is a time where Israel, as I have said, will be drawn to Yeshua as their Messiah, to, to the Lord Jesus. It will be a special time for Israel that God will deal with them. And also it will be a time where God will uh, judge the earth in, in, a, in a, a way and bring uh, history to a completion to set up his millennial reign, the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. But during that timeline, that seven-year period, we, the church, will not be present on earth. There will be people coming to Christ, tribulation saints, uh, but the church itself, all those from Pentecost on, will be gone, and we will be with the Lord in heaven. And there's two events that take place in heaven. The first is the Bema, or the judgment seat of Christ. And we'll explain that in a minute. And the second is the marriage supper of the Lamb. Well, the first event on this chart, as you will see, it shows us is the beam or judgment seat of Christ. And the Apostle Paul talks about this specifically in 2 Corinthians 5 and 1 Corinthians 3, 10 to 15. And Jesus talked about this, about rewards in so many ways. In fact, when you really look at the New Testament, I think throughout all the pages of the New Testament, both in the Gospels, the Epistles, uh, Acts, uh, etc., the whole subject of rewards is everywhere. There's a picture here of the Bema in ancient Athens. As you can see, it's, it's, it's elevated. A Bema was an elevated seat that a judge sat upon judging and rewarding athletes at athletic contests in contents contests in ancient Greece so that it, it's a good analogy to be used by Paul to address eternal rewards to the Corinthian church something they could relate to readily this is not and when I, I almost am so hesitant not to not to mention this or preach on this because people get all mixed up i thought we'd go to heaven based on faith not works this listen my friends this has nothing to do with our salvation this is a church coming before the bema the judgment seat of christ where christ will reward us for what we have done for him so it's nothing to do with our salvation. Our salvation is secure. Romans 8, 1, there is now therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. That's done and finished. Jesus Christ has paid for our sin on the cross. Our responsibility is to reach out in faith and appropriate that and make that ours. This is about being rewarded. Our God is a God that loves us and wants to reward us and encourage us. And that's what's going to take place at this time period in heaven. Reward us for all the activities done in Christ's likeness, in love that bring glory to God. All the things that we have done in grace and love will be rewarded no matter how small or trivial we feel they are. And this is where I think there will be many people, some person that behind the scenes prays faithfully, that, that gives, that encourages, that steps out in faith to help others, uh, that does kind deeds and acts, all these different things that maybe are not well known or not public will be rewarded and there'll be many surprises at the beam of the judgment seat of Christ. I think that many that um, have not been in the spotlight will that day be in the spotlight because of their great love and what they have done for Jesus Christ. Bruce Wilkerson, uh, his prayer of Jabez <laughs> that he did, I don't 
I don't recommend that. But The Life God Rewards, uh, it's a Bible study, and Allison has it up there for us by Bruce Wilkerson, uh, is excellent little book. I have several of them uh, down in, in the library at the church, my, my office. It is an excellent little book that describes um, the whole area of rewards because it can be confusing. Again, it has got nothing to do with our eternal destiny. That was settled at the cross, and this is to do with rewards, the blessings God has in store for us. And then we come to the second event, the marriage supper of the Lamb. This takes place towards the end of the tribulation period and extends into the, into the millennial kingdom and affects eventually all the redeemed from all the ages, both the New Testament saints, the Old Testament saints. So it en encompasses all of God's people. John says, let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory for the wedding of the lamb has come. And his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. And fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. Every time we celebrate the Lord's table, which is what we will do next week if he should tarry, we look forward to this event. It, it is part of the glorification process, celebrating the joy of the kingdom. I don't know in totality what this is all about, what, what will transpire. Um, but it will extend for an extended period of time. And all God's people will celebrate with the Lord Jesus Christ, the great redemption, the great grace and love he has for us. And it will just be a, a super awesome event. It helps us, though, if we look at the... Uh, wedding customs in Jesus' day because it parallels what takes place uh, leading up to this uh, wedding feast or wedding celebration of the Lamb. The, the wedding customs in Jesus' day had three major parts. First, a marriage contract was signed by the parents of the bride and the bridegroom. And the parents of the bridegroom or the bridegroom himself would pay a dowry to the bride or her parents. This began what was called a betrothal period, what we would call today an engagement. This period was the one that Joseph and Mary were in when she was found to be with a child in Matthew 1.18 and Luke 2.5. The second step in the process usually occurred a year later when the bridegroom, accompanied by his male friends, went to the house of the bride at night, creating a torch-lit parade through the streets, the bride would know in advance this was going to take place, and so she would be ready with her maidens, and they would all join the parade and end up at the bridegroom's house. This custom is the basis of the parable of the ten Ten virgins we see in Matthew 25, 1 to 13. The third phase, the third phase was the marriage supper itself, which might go on for days as illustrated by the wedding at Canaan in, in John 2, 1 to 2. What John's vision in Revelation pictures is the wedding feast of the Lamb, Jesus Christ and his bride, us, the church, in its third phase. The picture is that of the first two phases. The, the picture is that the first two phases have already taken place. The first phase was completed on earth when we trusted Christ. The dowry was paid to the bridegroom's parents, God the Father, and that dowry would be the blood of Jesus Christ shed on our behalf, the bride's behalf. The church today then is in a betrothed period to Christ. And like the wise virgins in the parable, all believers should be watching and waiting for the appearance of the bridegroom. And that will be, of course, what we have been talking about, our blessed hope, the rapture. 
The second phase, the rapture of the church, when Christ comes to claim his bride and take her to the Father's house. The marriage supper then follows as the third and final step. It will be a time of joy and celebration of all we have in Jesus Christ and the blessings we share because of what he has done for us. So you can see how that all fits in in a, in a beautiful picture leading up to this wedding festival, this wedding feast. I think there's one verse of scripture that just um, puts this all together. It is from Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 2, 9. And, and I, I take this from the New King James Version. We, we've talked about this, especially when we were talking about heaven. I has not seen nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. It, my friends, will be a celebration beyond compare. So we, we have those two things that take place during the tribulation period. The first is the bema, where we're rewarded uh, for the things that we have done in faithfulness for Jesus Christ and then the celebration that starts at the towards the end of the tribulation period and continues on into the millennial reign or the kingdom reign, the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ on earth. There's another thing that I want to touch on this morning as we bring this subject to a close. Some people in reading Revelation 13 6 to 17 and it states forced all people great and small rich and poor free and slave to receive a mark on their right hands or on their foreheads so that they could not buy or sell unless they had the mark which is the name of the beast or the number uh, of its name uh, get concerned the mark of the beast with all the ridiculous, and may I emphasize the ridiculous stuff that is on the internet these days, some folks worry that they have in some way taken this mark. Let me assure you, let me assure you, you haven't. It is impossible. Let me say that again. Let me assure you, you haven't. It is impossible. Let me wrench in a few points here to explain what I'm talking about, to put people's minds at ease. First off, people misunderstand the mark. The mark parallels God's ownership of his people, and Satan is a great duplicator. Please remember that. Satan tries to copy that. This is Satan's main plot. He tries to copy the things of the Lord. First, we need to look at God's mark on his people, and people overlook this all the time in the book of Revelation. They turn right to the mark of the beast, and they forget the foundation principles here. Although I am a futurist, and I agree, I agree, though, this morning with our all-millennial friends, that is, it is not a physical brand or mark Um but symbolic. The head refers to the mind and the hand actions, portraying in mind and actions one's loyalty, for example, to God. We'll see this in a minute. I'm going to read some verses. Listen to these scriptures that are overlooked by most, and they build the foundation to properly understand the context of Satan's counterfeit. This is so important. So important. In Reve Revelation 7, 3, it says, Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. In Revelation 9, 4, they were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any green plant or any tree, but only those people who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. 
Then I looked, and behold, on Mount Zion stood the Lamb, and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. They will see his face in Revelation 22, 4, and his name will be on their foreheads. Does this mean that there will be a mark on Christians' foreheads? Of course not. It is symbolic, again, of one's loyalty, one's heart devotion to Christ. The mark of the beast will demonstrate not physically, but spiritually, the followers of Satan and their devotion to him. This is vitally important in understanding the subject. Does everybody get that principle? It is symbolic. It is symbolic. Just as the mark on God's people is symbolic, so therefore the mark, as Satan tries to duplicate this, of the beast will be symbolic. B, secondly, when does this take place? When does it take place? Right, during the tribulation period, the beast has not appeared yet. Sometimes or sometime it will, will appear in the future, but who won't be here? Right, us, the church. We have been taken away. We have been raptured. We are where? In heaven. Celebrating these things like the Bema and the wedding feast of the Lamb. So this is impossible for any Christians today to be involved in this mark of the beast or at any time. People who tell you the mark of the beast is this and this today are absolutely wrong. And it's all over the internet. It doesn't even exist. Don't listen. It's just more junk that is floating around in the world of misinformation. And thirdly, those who come to faith in the tribulation period will in no way take this mark. So technically, no, trib no Christian or what we would call tribulation saint will ever take this mark. Only those who are absolutely sold out to Satan, who have rejected Christ, who have fully, I mean fully and totally embraced the satanic system of the Antichrist, will take this upon themselves. Again, the mark is not physical, but spiritual, and will display their allegiance to a system. Okay, it's not physical, but spiritual. It will display their allegiance to the system that opposes God, and they will worship that system. And worship is a large part uh, because it will display the heart and mind and actions of those who display what the Bible calls uh, this mark of the beast. This mark of the beast. So I hope this morning, if anyone is concerned about this and some of the stuff that's floating around today, this puts your mind at rest. I hope this explains it. So as we bring this little series to a conclusion, I just wanted to focus on these two things, the events that will take place with the church in heaven during the tribulation period and this mark of the beast to set people's minds at ease so they relax. All kinds of, again, uh, things floating around and, you, you know, whatever. Ignore that stuff. I've tried to explain this. Some people might disagree with me. That's okay. But I've tried to explain this in a responsible, exegetical way uh, so that people understand that it is a spiritual, not physical, but spiritual, the mark. And it will be evidenced by people's minds where their hearts are at and by their hands, by their actions, both for God and for Satan. I think the book of Revelation, when you properly understand that, makes that clear. It's funny, I used to have an old friend of mine, a pastor, that I used to golf with a little bit. 
and uh, he he called his putter six 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 or the mark of the beast because he six putted on every green. So <laughs> that was a little bit of a, a spiritual application. As we conclude about our blessed hope this morning, I, I turn to the, the words of the hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever will be. Pardon for sin and a peace that endureth. Thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide. Strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. Blessings all mine with 10,000 beside. Strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. That's what I hope this little series has brought you over the past few weeks, that it's encouraged your hearts. You've learned a few new things, maybe helped explain a few things. Again, uh, prophetic stuff is, is a huge subject. Uh, the doctrine of end times or eschatology is a huge subject that we could go on for years and years and years. This has just been a minor pinpoint glimpse. But in that glimpse, I hope you have learned a few things, been encouraged, and above all, we have endurance for today and hope, hope for tomorrow. It is our blessed hope. It is our blessed hope. My friends, hang on to that. One day Jesus will come in the clouds and he will take us home to be with him forever. And as the Bible says, so we will ever be with the Lord. And then as Paul closes, as we have seen last week, he says, therefore, encourage one another with these words. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning for this time together. We thank you for the blessings of your word and how we can just look at your word as we carefully try to understand the meaning for the original writers in the context. Father, as we take that in meaning and try and apply it to our situations and our lives today. Lord, we have nothing to fear absolutely nothing we are in your care and in your hands and father we know that someday jesus christ will come again for his church and claim all of us both those that have passed on and the living and translate transform us and give us our eternal bodies and so we will ever be with the lord and we will be equipped to live out eternity with him and with one another. What a great reunion that will be. Father, again, I pray for those that we've mentioned uh, physically, start of our service, that you'd be with them and help them. Father, those that are moving, that you'd comfort their hearts, encourage them in their new places, their new residences, the new places they'll live, and uh, help them to remember us in prayer that we love them and we will miss them. But Father, we pray for them and know that you will be with them in a special way. So Father, be with us now as we close this service, as we look forward to next week when we gather around the communion table, falling week as we celebrate Thanksgiving, and then as we move on the falling week to the book of Philippians. And uh, just as we study that and see how relevant that book is to us today. So, Father, be with us now this week. Guide us, bless us, and protect us. And we thank you for all of the hope, the blessed hope we have in you. For we ask these mercies in the name of him who loves us, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.